Hello and welcome to the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you are listening to episode number 27. Today I'm joined by Bernie Berenger, DIY hunter and accomplished outdoor writer. We're talking about what it takes to plan DIY hunting trips, out-of-state hunts, and how to plan for public land success, and much, much more. So stay tuned. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Truth from the Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you're listening to episode number 27. Uh, today I am joined by uh, Bernie Berenger. Uh, Bernie has a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the outdoors in general, as you'll as you'll find out. But his main forte, and really why I wanted to have him on, I've been pretty excited to have him on for a while now, is uh, his his knowledge in the in the realm of DIY hunting. Uh, Bernie is kind of a, an expert in that in that field, and uh, I was actually turned on to Bernie by a mutual friend uh, of ours, uh, our guest we had on not too long ago, Adam Parr. But before that, even I ran across the video that Bernie had put together. He's got a bunch of videos on YouTube. Um, of course, he's an outdoor writer, etc., and he has a bunch of books that he's written. But I ran across a video he created uh, and that was on YouTube about how to basically take a, just your run-of-the-mill uh, pull-behind trailer that you would see someone carrying lawn lawn equipment in or you know if they had some type of a landscaping uh, business they might use this to pull their gear with and he took it and he kind of modified it to to really fit his lifestyle to be a kind of on the go DIY hunter that way you don't have to really concern yourself with where you're going to stay it can kind of ha- it can be a place you sleep he, he modified it to put cabinets in an actual um, a deep free a small deep freeze cooler in it uh, hanging all your stands basically just kind of providing all the essentials that you would need to do a DIY hunt, whether it's out of state or whether you're traveling in your home state and you might have a, a little bit of a, a drive to get there and you might want to stay overnight to kind of hit the timber extra early. And that was really my first kind of uh, interaction with Bernie's content. And then from there, I just kind of come to understand how much knowledge he really has beyond just uh, building interesting contraptions to get you from point A to point B uh, in in the hunting woods. Uh, but I won't belabor kind of introducing him too much here because I really kind of want him to, to share as much knowledge as, as he possibly can and don't want to cut his time sh- short. Uh, just a few quick pieces of housekeeping here before we get Bernie dialed in. One, uh, I'm not sure if, if, if any of you have seen or, or who has seen, but I did make a video last week uh, that you might be uh, that you might want to check out. It was a Montana Montana elk hunt archery preparation video. It was really just a, a video, you know, a sequence that I like to go through to kind of prepare myself for hunting uh, the, you know, the big woods, whether it's uh, whitetail hunting or this instance, uh, particularly hunting in Montana and, you know, having to deal with pack weight and potentially shooting with a pack. And it's just a sequence that I like to go through to kind of prepare myself for those types of odd hunting scenarios that you might find yourself in. You know, we do the best preparation we can at the range and not everything always comes in at an even yardage. And it certainly doesn't come in whenever you have the opportunity to set yourself up for an op- optimum body position to take a shot. So that's really kind of what this video kind of dives into is, you know, the things that I do to kind of prepare myself for those uh, ad hoc moments and, and per- you know, prepare to hopefully deliver, you know, an ethical shot and a successful shot at the same time. And one other thing I'd like to mention is a good buddy of ours, John Utah Mulligan, uh, who some of you may remember him. He was on the podcast not too long ago. He has a web uh, video hunting video show uh, at Arrow Wild Company. Uh, You can find them on Facebook, but he uh, created some uh, really awesome shirts. I picked one up this week and I'm always into, you know, giving some folks a shout out who are, you know, number one buddies in the industry, but who also are, are, are good guys and uh, are doing things on their own and trying to really kind of create a company around creating good content, delivering good content to hunters. Um, so just want to make quick mention of that. If you're interested to pick up a shirt, you can hit him up at Arrow Wild Company uh, on Facebook and just tell him that uh, that Truth From The Stand sent you. And before we get Bernie on the line here, I just want to take a quick break to hear from our partners at Whitetail Institute of North America for the Whitetail Institute Food Plot Tip of the Week. Today, John shares how to implement a down and dirty food plot that will get the job done but if you have to do it down and dirty and do it real quickly and again realize that uh this is not going to be the absolute best growing environment some things are able to do a lot better in that than others like no plow uh secret spot uh uh, bow stand they're designed to do very well uh in in a seed bed that's been minimally prepared 
Uh, a matter of fact, Secret Spot and Bostan have a pH booster in them that is absolutely not a full lime job. It will bump it a little bit if it's slightly acidic. Uh, but choose a product that's designed for that. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, if you have something like alfalfa, if you, have, if you plant alfalfa in soil that is of a soil pH below 6.5, it is going to struggle. Alfalfa is very, very highly wed to proper pH. Some things are more forgiving of slightly low soil pH that is rising because it's been limed. Um, if you have to do it down and dirty, uh, try to remove as much grass and weeds you can as you can from the seedbed. The best way to do that, I think, is by spraying a Roundup-type glyphosate herbicide because uh, that, uh, as opposed to mowing, that kills the roots of, of the grasses and weeds, and it makes more root space for the forage plants. If at all possible, lime it according to a soil test. If you can't, uh, look at the default recommendations on the back of the bag. It will tell you to, how much lime to add just as a default recommendation. And also be sure to fertilize because you've got to have the soil pH right so the plants can get the nutrients. you got to have the nutrients out there for the plants to get, so don't skip those. Uh, then you want to, if you can, try to scratch the lime and, uh, and the fertilizer into the soil you know, with a rake, whatever you can. Just do the best you can to get it to a ready-to-plant seed bed. Just do the best you can. Uh, if you follow the instructions on the back of the bag, it'll get you where you need to be. Uh, if you want to see what's involved uh, between preparing a fully prepared seed bed and a minimally prepared seed bed, go to our website and look at the planting instructions for Imperial Whitetail No-Plow. Uh, I think that's the only one we've got Two written sets of instructions, one for when you get out there with your equipment, do your soil test, and start working a few months ahead of time, or just getting out there and just doing it down and dirty and getting the planting in. But you can see what's involved. And that, folks, is a Whitetail Institute tip of the week. If you'd like to learn how to create an easy-to-prep seed bed that requires no equipment, head over to whitetailinstitute.com and check out the planting instructions for Imperial Whitetail No Plow. Now let's get back to the show. All right, welcome back to another episode of Truth from the Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and today I am joined by Bernie Berenger. Uh, Bernie is a uh, very accomplished outdoor writer, and was turned. Uh, uh, I was turned on to his work by a friend of ours who was on the podcast not too long ago, uh, Adam Adam Parr. And the funny thing was, was after I kind of started reading through uh, some of the, some of Bernie's uh, writings and uh, looking through some of his vid videos, I had realized I had been kind of had discovered you prior to uh, to talking to Adam, but it was kind of nice to uh, kind of have a rediscovery. But Bernie's joining us today to talk about all things DIY uh, deer hunting. Uh, he has a vast knowledge of uh, of hunting beyond uh, beyond deer hunting. He's written a multitude of books covering uh, ranging from everything from DIY deer hunting to bear hunting, and I think even trapping, if I'm not mistaken. So, without further ado, how you doing, Bernie? I'm doing great. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you making some time to uh, to join us. So, you know, I know that I've done a little bit of background research on you and, and had read, uh, you know, several of your writings and watched some of your videos. And there's one I want to get into it at, at one point was really, I think, my introduction to you. But uh, for those at home listening that maybe aren't as uh, as aware of uh, who you are and what you do, uh, if you could just give us a little bit of background about, about yourself, where you're from, uh, how you started in the hunting industry and what you do for a living. Uh, sure. Yeah, I'm a full-time outdoor writer. Um, I got my start basically uh, uh, as a full-time commercial fur trapper, specializing in raccoon and mink. And uh, back in the 80s, when the fur prices were good, made a pretty good living at it uh, during the fall and winter and did whatever it took in the summer to get by, including working on a commercial fishing boat in Alaska and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. But uh, um, uh, when the fur markets fell apart in the late eighties, um, and I was 30 years old, I had a wife and three kids, but I went back to college, got a degree in journalism and, and started writing about it. Uh, it's just started out writing trapping books and, and, I uh, did some videos with Tom Miranda and, uh, and a lot of magazine articles and graduate, you know, started also doing fishing and hunting. I've been a bow hunter since 1973. Um, and, uh, so you know, when the fur markets got bad, I, I branched out into other stuff and I've also been in professional tournament fishing and a lot of other stuff, but, uh, uh, back to writing full time now since 2009. And, uh, so yeah, I've written, uh, I think 14 books and, and about a thousand magazine articles. 
and uh, do a lot of online writing now too. I've had to adapt. Um, I still do a lot of print writing for all the Whitetail magazines. I got a I got a DIY column in each issue of North American Whitetail. I also am in all the issues of uh, Whitetail Journal and and I do some writing for websites like Realtree dot com and Outdoor Hub and so forth and. And uh, so, yeah, it keeps me busy and uh, keeps me from having to get a real job, I guess you could say. <laughs> hey, that's always that's always a bonus, right? As long as you can fend that off for as long as you can, then you're, you're winning in my book. But you worked on some fishing boats in Alaska. I got to ask you. So there's obviously, you know, I don't even know if it's on any longer because I cut the uh, the cable cord, you know, some time ago. But the uh, Alaskan fishing show that used to be, I think it was on History Channel or A&E or whatever the case was. Is that is that pretty accurate to what you would experience on a fishing boat in, a, in Alaska? Uh, yeah, I guess that was I a crab boat. But. Yeah, that was a crab boat, and and they crab fish in the winter. Um, I was on a salmon boat in the summer. It's um, it's an incredible amount of work. It, uh, there's no way TV can really uh, portray the brutality of it, of just how hard and how long the hours are, and so forth. And then you add the fact that it's winter mm-hmm. when you're crab fishing, and it's that much worse. So. It's a definitely a young man's game, and, and a lot of that stuff kind of – I'd watch that show, and, you know, I'd think about wearing those uh, uh, those orange uh, rubber suits for, you know, 30, 40 hours straight, and it just kind of makes me shudder and think, man, I'd hate to have to go back and do that again. But, boy, there's a lot of money to be made. It was – you know, there was there's a lot of value in it, too. I really um, – you know, enjoyed the, the aspect that, uh, you know, when you walk away at the end of the summer, you gotta you got to – pretty big payday right yeah i had one buddy actually who actually actually went and worked on a crabbing boat in alaska and i thought he was tough before that but that just kind of reaffirmed he had a whole another level of toughness in, in my mind when he came back from that but uh turning right. back to to whitetail i wanted to you know kind of pick your brain here and kind of get an idea of you know i know that your forte or your you know you have a multitude of experience across the the, the board when it comes to outdoors <laughs> Um, but I want to kind of dive more specifically into your DIY hunting background, but how did you get into the DIY hunts? I kind of call them adventure hunts, you know, so to, so to speak. I mean, was it something that was yeah. originally kind of out of necessity? Like, did you lack access to land or was just, that was just kind of the way you were brought up? I'm just kind of curious how you got into that. I think it was somewhat that I, I lacked access to land. Now, when I was in high school, um, you know, I could find a place to bow hunt. I lived in Northern Iowa. That's where I grew up. And, um, I could find a bow a bowing spot pretty easy, you know. I mean, uh, we had I could just walk talk to the farmers in our church, you know, and right. and uh, get plenty of places to bow hunt. I was in the wrong part of Iowa for mature bucks, and after I had some success, you know, then I started being more interested in and uh, um, going for a more mature buck and having a chance to shoot a really nice whitetail, and so I started making trips from where I live in northern Iowa into the southern part of the state into some of the counties that produce bigger bucks and hunting public land and i'd stay in a motel and so forth well um then uh in 2001 i uh, uh the fishing business took me to brainerd minnesota well um this is the land of the forkhorn up here and right. um, literally you know 80 percent of the bucks in this part of the state are shot when they're a year and a half old and mm-hmm. there's a kind of a there's a, a very frustrating mentality here and uh, so um, I just basically decided, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to branch out even more. I started going to North Dakota and South Dakota and Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa. Uh, you know, whenever I draw a tag, I go back to Southern Iowa, mm-hmm. uh, Missouri, um, some of these over-the-counter states, and then also tag drawing states. So I've hunted, uh, you know, even Kentucky and quite a few other states, and usually two or three I got at the peak there, I was doing two or three a year. Last year, I just did two. And most years now, I just do two states in addition to my home state. But um, I kind of developed a taste for the challenge of going to public land in a far off area and just figuring it out. And it's it's difficult um, because the deer are pressured somewhat on, on public land and and uh, the, the strategies that they use um, are different. And, uh, you know, uh, I just sort of rose to a, a place where I had enough success where some of the magazines started asking for more and more of this type of stuff. And, and at about the same time, you know, uh, outdoor TV was really exploding. 
And all of a sudden you got all these people from the East Coast and the Southeast and, and, you know, Michigan and places where they're watching TV going, holy smokes, I'd never shoot a buck like that where I live. You know, maybe I should go to Kansas or Iowa or Missouri or something. So I was really in a good position there to to capitalize on the knowledge that I was gaining and just and sort of rise to uh, a level of authority within the hunting business as the do-it-yourself public land traveling bow hunter guy. I started calling myself the freelance bow hunter and wrote a, a book called The Freelance Bow Hunter, which has been incredibly successful. Uh, it was uh, shocking how well that book is done. Uh, I didn't realize how big the market for this actually is. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I had, to, you know, I've been kind of focusing a lot of the podcast l- lately on predominantly, you know, more of the public land and, and DIY hunting. And I think you're right. It's like just in my, you know, what I'll say, humble opinion. You know, I can definitely see a shift where growing up, I would say it was more of a people turn their nose up at, at public land hunting or in DIY hunting, if you will. Um, and I, I, at least I've seen a shift lately where it seems like, you know, people are really kind of embracing the challenge um, and appreciating the, the access that they have. I know for me, you know, I grew up with, with some land in Pennsylvania or some family that had some land and stuff like that. And it kind of similar to Minnesota where there, you know, you didn't see a lot of big deer. We have antler restrictions now, which have helped, but still it's nothing, you know, compared to what you see in the Midwest. And so I took a DIY trip for the first time this year uh, to Ohio, had a great hunt, had, had success actually. Um, and it's just one of those things. Now it's, it's kind of that itch that you want to continually scratch. Cause now it's, I'm kind of excited to see what's around every new corner going to Montana this year on an elk hunt, a DIY hunt. So I've definitely, uh, I watched some of your videos that kind of got me uh, started. It was actually the one where you made the, uh, the camper, uh, out of the, uh, the pool oh, behind. Sure. And, uh, yeah, you bet. yeah, that kind of got me going where I was like, you know what? I was like, that's something I could, that's something I could do, you know? And I think that that's the important thing. And, and that's the, kind of the, you know, next question here is, you know, what are a couple things people need to consider when they're thinking about doing a DIY hunt or kind of deciding between a DIY or a guided hunt? Because, as I was just mentioning, a lot of people I think have this mis, uh, you know, or this perception of DIY hunting that can't be pulled off, or that it's expensive, or that they can't do it, or they just can't get access, or whatever the case is, you know. And from my personal opinion, you know, DIY hunts aren't necessarily for everyone either. Just the amount of work and preparation you kind of have to put into it. So, what are some things people need to consider when they're deciding to do a DIY hunt, and what are some of those the, the thought process that kind of needs to go into it? Well, you have to like a challenge. Um, you know, if, if you really are interested in just going and having someone else have the tree stand for you and have things figured out and tell you to just go sit over here and, and you got a chance of having a 125 or 135 inch buck walk by, you know, if, if, if that's what you're really after, then the IY hunt's not for you because, um, it's a lot of work and the success rates aren't very high. You know, I, I figure if a guy get, it, it depends on what your standards are, you know, you know, I, I, I try to, bring home 130 inch buck is kind of what my uh, level is that I, that I'm interested in. And, um, I've, you know, not all of them have been that big, but then I've also had a couple where I, I just drove home with a huge smile on my face because <laughs> of the buck that's in the back of the truck, you know, right. but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's difficult. It, um, so you have to be up for a challenge and you have to be willing to really work hard and learn it because, uh, you know, it, it is hard work to, to study, to scout, to run the trail cameras, to hang stands, move stands, um, you know, haul the stuff around. And, you know, there's been a lot of times when I've had three, four stands in the woods, and, uh, you know, 10th or 11th day I'm out and I'm, and I finally get a deer. And then also I'm like, cracks, I got all day tomorrow, just getting stands down and getting stuff packed up before <laughs> I can leave, you know? Right. So it, I mean, it's hard work. And, uh, but so, but if you like a challenge, the rewards, the feeling of just walking into a place blind and after a few days, you know, shooting a nice buck and th- there, it's just hard to put a dollar value or a, you know, any kind of a value on how good that feels when, um, when you accomplish it and, and not every hunt has to mean there's antlers in the back of the truck. I've had successful hunts that I just had a great time and saw a lot of cool stuff and, um, and actually didn't get a deer, but I learned enough that maybe the next year I'd be more successful. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a whole nother angle on this too, as far as, you know, should you keep going back to the same place every year as you learn it? Or, you know, do you like to try new places and see new country and try new things that, you know, that's, 
that's something that's an individual preference too, you know. Right. So what's speaking of that, what's your what's your individual preference on that? I mean, do you do you tend to like to kind of have like a, you know, maybe it's you go to one traditional spot a year and then a new spot every year just so you maybe have that heightened opportunity of success in an area ver, you know versus in a, a completely unknown that way you're kind of splitting your I guess hedging your bets a little bit for the season yeah I'm I that's pretty much you kind of nailed basically where I'm at although I kind of lean a little bit towards the trying new stuff because you know like going to Kentucky uh, the first of September for example that was like um, so I've never hunted in 80, 90 degrees before. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, going out in the evening and seeing, um, you know, seeing really nice bucks and velvet was pretty exciting and getting some on trail camera. Uh, I didn't actually end up shooting a deer on that particular hunt. Um, but it, it, the reality is if you want to have a chance to shoot a mature buck, your chances are better if you go back to an area and learn it. And, uh, um, you know, once you find a good area with two or three good stand spots, especially if it's a rut hunt, sometimes you'll find these spots that you just find, eventually you feel like if I just park my butt in a tree right here, um, I'm probably going to have a chance to shoot a nice buck if I stick it out for three, four days. And, uh, those spots just don't jump out at you all the time. Um, so it takes time to develop those spots. I got a couple spots like that in Kansas where I, you know, I've killed some nice bucks and, and I, I feel confident that if I get back off the road and into some of these areas that get very little hunting pressure, um, I can pick a tree. And if I am willing to put my time in there, I've, I've got a pretty good chance that I'm going to shoot, see a one thirty or better buck in three or four or five days. Nice. Those are, uh, those are good trees to have. I'll, I'll say it's, uh, I think yeah. I, might, I might've stumbled onto one to, uh, in Ohio this past year. We'll, I'm actually headed back there again uh, this coming year for um, for a couple of days at least. So I guess I'll I'll, I'll see if that uh, actually bears fruit or not. I'm hoping that it does. But you touched on something yeah. or were alluding to something earlier that I think is an important piece of kind of d- deciding whether or not you're going to DIY it or not is really kind of setting expectations before you get there, right? It's like if you to your point, it's like if you want to kill a 130 or bigger. Um, you know, it, and that's kind of your, your expectation. You might want to rethink the opportunity, but if you're kind of in it for the experience, um, and still have an opportunity depending on where you're hunting, you know, then DIY hunting might be, you know, might be for you. Um, I know for me, it's, you know, I definitely have to kind of, re- even going back to the same spot this coming year, I have to kind of recalibrate my expectations because it was the first year there and I had a great kill and, um, but I know that that's not always the case too. So you have to kind of temper your enthusiasm just a little bit. Um, yeah, and you and you you know that that can change through the course of a hunt too. Oh yeah, um, you know you you might go out to a place that you've never hunted before, and uh, and you're thinking you know I'm going to try to stick to a 130 inch minimum, and then after five days you got trail cameras out and you've been sitting in the stand and everything like that, and you realize you don't have a single 130 inch buck on film or on camera, right. or you haven't seen one, you might have to readjust your. Um, your expectations and you know there, there's a statement that you shouldn't pass on the first day when you what you would shoot on the last day right and that's a really bad that's really bad advice for a diy hunter the, the, that's i think the guides made that up because they'd like to see you shoot a buck right away and then they want to see your tail right taillights going down the road so they don't have to feed you anymore <laughs> you know and uh uh, but realistically your your expectations can change through the course of a hunt and you know, there's been a couple other times where, you know, I killed a, a, a big eight pointer Kansas here, what, three or four years ago, where this buck became my target because I'm like, man, he's, he's in this area a lot. I figured out where he was bedding at. And, uh, you know, I found a doe bedding area that uh, he's checking the, this doe bedding area every day and I ended up getting him. And, um, you know, he was well above my, I didn't even measure him. I think he's, he's between 145 and 150 as an eight pointer. So he's a big one, yeah, that's a but, big uh, you know, realistically, I just thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to shoot this deer. Yeah. I, and, and I focused on him. So that 130 inch minimum kind of went out the window when I realized I really had a very high percentage chance of shooting that bigger buck. So it right. all changes. And, and, you know, there's so many things that are a part of the decision-making process. Um, and, you know, trail cameras are just a huge part of it. 
But before we hear how Bernie likes to use his trail cameras, let's take a quick break to hear a word about our partners at Exodus Outdoor Gear. Who doesn't like summer velvet card pulls? Exodus customer Chris Applestat shares one of his favorite parts of using his Exodus trail camera, enjoying the excitement and the hope of the velvet rut for the leading into the upcoming season. So I'd say the, the Exodus story that sticks out the most to me was the fact that this was my first year putting cameras out in the spring. I'd only ever done it in season before. And uh, I really put in a lot of extra time working on some lanes and some trails where I, I knew there were deer, but I was trying to help usher them in the right direction close to my stand and uh, getting the opportunity to watch over the course of the spring and summer, the, uh, the little nubs turn into antlers and the velvet get bigger and bigger was really, really cool. It was an exciting process and, you know, just every time I'd pull the camera, I would get to compare and see how much bigger it got and look at the uh, the thickness of the bases and say, man, this guy's going to be awesome. And kind of learning about how to determine the age of a deer and the maturity level. But I'd say that was my that was my most exciting part about using the Exodus camera was getting to watch, watch that development happen for the first time um, and something I'm going to continue to do you know, moving forward as a hunter. And that, folks, is an Exodus experience. If you'd like to learn more or purchase an Exodus trail camera, visit them at exodusoutdoorgear.com. The guys from Exodus are also hooking up all the truth from the stand listeners with a 10% discount on any camera purchase when you use the promo code TRUTH at checkout. And let's get back to the show. You know, I'm I'm probably putting out, uh, on an average hunt, six six to eight covert cameras. And, you know, I spent a lot of my first couple days just scouting and putting out the cameras and so forth and, and you know, try to get up on a high hill or something like that where I can glass places and try to figure out what's going on and uh, walk and figure out where the bedding areas are. Uh, one of the mistakes that I made early on when I was doing this was well, I'd find a spot that's all tore up with rubs and scrapes and I go, oh man, can't wait to hunt here. And I put up a tree stand and, it, you know, you just don't know if there's even an even better spot just over the hill. Right. And if you do that, you know, that might be a good evening stand, but then also you get down the stand uh, and even go back to your motel room and go, Oh crap, where am I going to hunt in the morning? Right. So you really have to, uh, don't get in the stand too early, you know, do the research, do the, um, do the work. And before you actually plan out where the next few days are going to be spent. And then once you, uh, develop your plan towards the end of a week, let's say you have a week hunt, Within, um, you know, after three days or so, four days, you have a pretty good idea where your odds are going to be the best. And it's, it's sort of like pushing all your chips into the middle in poker. You go, okay, this stand here for this win and that stand there, the, that's where I'm going to spend the rest of my week because these are where my best shots of um, of shooting a mature buck are going to be. And, and so it's kind of a scattered um, strategy at first, and then it gets narrowed down to the point where you really feel pretty confident. And it's not always that way on every hunt. Right. I mean, I've, I've hunted for a week in some areas and go, crepes, I don't know any more now than I did when I showed up, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, you, you'd mentioned using cameras and, you know, given that, you know, some of these places that you're, that you're hunting are, you know, a bit of travel distance away. I just wanted to get a sense of, you know, how are you using, you know, the cameras in these scenarios where you, where you have travel or distance between yourself and the property that you're hunting? Are you hanging them, you know, are you going out there in the summer and doing some scouting or the spring and scouting and hanging them there? Are you making a trip out right before the season or, and then what are you looking for in those cameras? Are you just kind of getting an inventory or are you really trying to hone in on, you know, patterns, if you will? Um, that that's a lot of good questions. I think there's a chapter on each of those questions in my book. <laughs> so <laughs> but, uh, the the, the, you know, the sidebar is is by the book. That's the yeah. sidebar. Uh, but realistically, uh, there's been several times I, I've done several different things with the cameras. Um, I've got a lot of friends in a lot of areas, and and uh, I have shipped cameras to buddies who went and put them out for me. Um, you know, that's what I'll do this year. I'm expecting to draw an Iowa tag this year. I've got four points, so. Uh, or three points and uh, I should draw. So, um, you know, I got a buddy down there who's going to go put a half dozen cameras out for me two or three weeks before I come. Um, another, other times like, uh, I had a Northwest corner of Kansas and I had a spot in Nebraska that I wanted to check out. So I just went through there on my way out 
and put three cameras out. And then on my, after I got done in, in uh, Kansas, then I had, you know, 10 days of, uh, of the cameras working for me. Um, I, I also did that on a Montana hunt one time where I stopped in North Dakota and put out some cameras on my way to Montana. And then, um, when later when I went to hunt in North Dakota, I had, uh, uh, well, two of the three cameras were left. Unfortunately, one of them, the guy came along with a hacksaw and figured out how to hack the, uh, they were in steel boxes and everything. And oh, a wow. guy, a, a guy got one of them, but, uh, um, you know, so that, that's, that's one way to do it. But then another one of the questions that you alluded to there was the importance of, you know, what are you seeing on there? And the biggest part I think is just to inventory what deer are available and try to get a feel for how nocturnal they are, how much, you can kind of tell how much pressure these deer are getting by how many daylight photos you get of them. Right. Um, and you can figure out where they're feeding by what trails they're using. So many public hunting areas are, um, are timber and then they're surrounded by farmland and the deer are using the public areas for bedding and then feeding in the surrounding private land. So, um, those cameras give you a lot of information about that type of thing. And this, this is another issue, but a lot of people will say you just got to penetrate way into these public lands to get away from the pressure, um, to find the bigger bucks. And sometimes that's true because, uh, most people, the locals primarily hunt on the evenings and weekends. And so they're fairly close to the road because they're, mm-hmm. they're going out to the stand after work, you know? Right. Um, so getting way back off the road can really be beneficial, but other times, um, these deer are exiting this property. And so the edges of the property are sometimes better than way back in. So don't pigeonhole yourself into just thinking you got to get way back out there. Right. Um, I've got spots where that's true, but, uh, you know, I've been using the fat tire bikes, the quiet cat bike. Oh my goodness. What a game changer for, I can check my trail cameras. It used to take me hours to walk to a trail camera and I can do it in, you know, 15 or 20 minutes right. on this electric fat tire bike. Um, that's been a real game changer for me but as far as checking cameras. I can't, it's hard to believe how much difference that makes. Right. I wanted to ask you if, you know, speaking of highly I guess, pressured areas. And sometimes whenever you're hunting public land, you don't always have the best access routes, right? Cause sometimes you just, you know, with all the other research that you're doing or all the other, you know, figuring, if you will, that you're doing, um, even though access is an important part, it's always, even if you have manicured land, it still is always a bit of a challenge. So I was just curious if you ever kind of use the philosophy when you're hunting in an area where you know that you might be getting kind of off the beaten path where maybe they're not getting a ton of pressure in this specific area, and maybe you know there's a buck bedding in a certain spot. Do you ever kind of take the the bump and hunt approach where you go in early, know you're likely going to bump, but know that he's not been disturbed enough that he may come back to that bed that evening to, to hunt him that evening on his return? I've done that a couple times and I had a couple close calls with that. That is, uh, that is kind of a last resort type of thing because it's only going to work once, maybe twice at the most. Right. But, it, but literally if you, if you know where that buck is spending his daytime, um, and you can sneak in there and without really spooking him bad, um, you know, I call it bump and hunt because, um, what you're doing is you're trying to get him to just see you first and then sneak out. And maybe you just, maybe you just hear him sneaking away or, or just see a, a white tail or something like that. They're not going to snort and blow and, crash away but then you can position yourself just downwind of where they'll, they'll typically quarter into the wind to come back into their hunting their bedding area i mean and you can you can quickly hang a stand and two three hours later that buck's liable to come back and uh that's been successful for a couple of people i've had a couple of close calls that way um i know a, i know a guy who literally um went into the stand in in the buck's bedding area at night after the buck left and ratchet strapped himself into the tree and slept in the tree and killed the 170 inch buck the next morning on public land where this buck had, he had everybody figured out and he just didn't leave his bed until dark. And he didn't, he came back right before daylight and uh, this guy figured out where he's bedded. And, and, uh, and that's a radical strategy, but he's got a booner on the wall because he, he 
did something radical. Right. That that is uh, that is the definition I think of a dedicated whitetail hunter right there. I, I like <laughs> that might be one of the best strategies I think I've ever heard of. Um, <laughs> so when you start, and I'm kind of working backwards here, but when you start narrowing down a specific location that you want to hunt, say you've kind of, you know, decided your state and, you know, kind of maybe it's the, and you decided the the public parcel that you want to focus on, what type of tools are you using just to kind of get started? You know, are you, I mean, I'm assuming you're going to your aerials first, you know, are you, are you hitting those areas if you can to do some postseason scouting? Are you using, you know, you know, I know I, I try to reach out to some biologists once in a while to try to see if I can't get the drop on a decent location or some place where they've done like a burn where I know that the, the regrowth is going to be really good. So can you just kind of talk a little bit about how you kind of qualify a parcel whenever you kind of narrow down, you know, a general area? That's a really important part of this because um, and it, I, you can call it e-scouting or whatever, but aerial photos will reveal some pretty remarkable things about public properties. And you'll, if you do it long enough, you'll start to recognize areas where you go, you know, that there might be pretty good. And if it doesn't get a lot of uh, hunting pressure back in there, that could be a really good spot. And you won't probably know until you go in there and look for sign and so forth. But the, the key to it is uh, having a long list of areas before you leave home to check out. And then, and then when you arrive, you know, get your cameras out and, and you gotta, you gotta hunt more aggressively. This is really important. Because, like, if you're at home, you might have, in, and let's say you're a property owner, you probably have inviolate areas uh, where the deer bed and so forth, and you just don't go in there. Um, you don't have that luxury on public land. You ha- there's The only way to find the bedding areas a lot of times is just walk through them. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, you, you just have to hunt more aggressively. you got to be willing to move more, scout harder, and so forth. And, uh, but going back to before you leave home, it's always a good idea to make a few phone calls to a property manager. Um, you know, whether it's county or state property, you got game wardens, you got biologists, um, and ask very specific questions about, um, what the potential for the property is and what the access points are like. And, um, sometimes, you know, you can look at something on Google earth and you think, okay, I'll walk back in there. And then you arrive and find out that there's a big swamp between you and where you want to get to or something like that. You can't actually walk through it. Um, So those are questions that you can ask. And the biologists have a pretty good idea and the game wardens have a pretty good idea of what kind of pressure the thing is getting, um, what kind of the, what kind of potential the, you know, the property has to produce. And a lot of times they'll say, Hey, there's this, there's this little, you know, I'm say I'm looking at a 1,200 acre piece, and they might say there's this little 80 acre piece down here. Hardly anybody hunts that, right? And um, you know, so it's surprising what you'll come up with. And but those calls are all important. And uh, you know, then when you get your boots on the ground and you arrive, then then it's time to really work it out and and uh, and learn it. Right. So whenever you and again, I apologize, but I'm kind of working backwards here, but. So you've kind of narrowed this one area down, but, you know, prior to that, you, you of course have to kind of determine what state you, you want to kind of head to, which is kind of, you know, I guess the starting point, if you will, you know, what, you know, what are some of the best states you found at least for DIY hunts that, you know, of course would have plenty of public land access, et, et cetera. So what are some of those places you kind of really earmark as either places to return or places where you really enjoy the hunts and, uh, and why? Okay, excuse me. Um, yeah, that's that's a really good question. There, there's a lot of states that I've hunted that uh, um, that I really love going back to. North Dakota is one of them, and and, and largely that's just because uh, the, there's an abundance of public land and very little hunting pressure on, in most of North Dakota because it spreads them out. Now, a lot of these public properties get a fair amount of pressure during rifle season. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if you go the end of October, sometimes you don't see another truck in a parking lot, and that's pretty cool. Um, a lot of people don't know how to hunt that type of properties out there because it's flat country mostly, and it's shelter belts, and you don't have the oak trees and, and the types of things where, you know, if you're from the eastern half of the U.S., it's just going to look a lot different to you. First mm-hmm. time I went to North Dakota, I had a climber stand in the truck, and it took me about 20 minutes to realize I didn't need to bring that because there wasn't a tree you could climb in the whole <laughs> that part of the state, you know. Right. But uh, so I, I ended up using ladder stands and uh, um, 
ground blinds. Um, so uh, North Dakota has an abundance of public land. Uh, they, they have what they call the uh, PLOTS program, private land open to sportsmen. And that's where um, farmers designate their property as public land. Basically, you can use their land to hunt on without without even tracking them down to find a permission. Um, Kansas has a program like that called WEHA, Walk-In Hunting Area. Hmm. Um, and there's several other states. It's, it's becoming more and more popular to do that. And I, mostly they're taking hunters' uh, license fees and, and paying small fees to these landowners to increase the amount of public land available. Um, Nebraska is another state that just doesn't get as much pressure as you might think and has good whitetails. I, I love going to Kansas and Iowa because you, you just always have a chance of shooting a really nice buck. Iowa limits their non-resident tags to 6,000 tags for total and the majority a lot of those are bow hunters but uh there's enough public land in iowa that you can have some elbow room and you literally have a chance to see a 150 every time you go hunt iowa mm-hmm. and they're proud of their tags man they they the prices are horrible mm-hmm. but uh you know you're only gonna draw about every third or fourth year so yeah. um you might as well save up and just do it because it's worth going to iowa and um kansas i like missouri uh, Missouri is kind of a bargain. It's only about two hundred fifty dollars for a non-resident tag, and you can buy it over the counter. So, you know, a typical hunt, which might be the case this fall for me, you know, I drew if I draw an Iowa tag, I'm expecting to. Well, I'll spend a week or ten days or whatever it takes in Iowa, and then I can just go across the border into Missouri and just um, scout and, and look around. If I see what looks pretty good to me, I can just go to town and buy a license and hunt. Right. So. Um, you know, they're, they're different that way. Um, you know, I think I list 16 states in my book. Uh, I call them destination states. And, um, you know, Wisconsin and Illinois are, are other good examples of states that produce quality whitetails, but they have huge amounts. They're, the public land in those two states gets a lot of pressure. Really, And um, it, so they have the potential to produce really good bucks, but, boy, you're going to have company. <laughs> and uh i i'm i'm more of a loner so i'd rather be out in north dakota where um you know i'm probably not going to see anybody else's trail camera or tree stand in a week of hunting right that's always a that's always a good feeling whenever you feel like you're you have a little bit as you call it elbow room which is nice the uh it's it's interesting that you mentioned the trees and 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 uh in north dakota um and realizing that you didn't need your climber when you got there but you know what are you looking for whenever you're trying to locate the the right tree to crawl into, you know, it's, um, is it, do you have a different approach for the different times of the different times of the hunting season? Or do you have kind of like a, usually a methodical approach that you follow no matter the time? Can you kind of talk a little bit about how you pinpoint where you need to be uh, climbing into? Yeah, it really depends on, on, uh, what time of the year I'm going and, um, what the stage of the rut is and so forth. Now, if it's an early season hunt, it's probably all about the food. You know, find the bedding areas, find where they're feeding, and get on a trail in between there. It's you know, it's pretty much that simple. And uh, you know, most of my hunts, I try to pack them in between the last few days of October and, and second or third week in November. And uh, you know, I do as many as three hunts a year. The end of October, hunting scrapes and rubs is pretty effective at most times. Um, I'm also using calling and rattling more at that time. And then, you know, the first week in November, as we get into that, the deer are running more, the bucks are on their feet during the day, and that's that's a good time to use decoys. Um, it's when you start looking for typical rutting areas and uh, pinch points and funnels where the deer are really starting to be on the move. Um, and that that's the best time. You know, the first two weeks in November are the best time to be parked in a stand for long hours in the right spot. The third week in November is a time that is often overlooked because most of the breeding takes place across the Midwest before that period. And then the bucks are still, they're they're really on their feet a lot during the daylight, you know, after the middle of November until about Thanksgiving. And uh, a lot of the pressure is off. Uh, you know, most people that want to do a rut hunt in the Midwest will schedule their trip between the 5th and the 15th of November. And uh, so after that, sometimes you find yourself in a situation where there isn't as much pressure. 
and uh, there's still bucks that are really cruising. Right. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, um, I have two kind of parting questions for you because I want to be sensitive to your time and I appreciate you making, making some time to join me this evening. But one is, you know, for that guy or girl who really wants to do a DIY hunt, they want to put in the work, they want to put in the, you know, the e-scouting that we've talked about and, and, and cameras and, and try to do it, get it out there and do a boots on the ground scout and kind of check all the boxes, right? But say they're kind of a weekend warrior, right? They don't have a ton of time off, you know, because a lot of, you know, just like me, you know, working the, the normal, you know, nine to fiver. And a lot of times my opportunity to get out is I take some vacation time for my longer extended hunts, um, but often, in, in, you know, kind of relegated to my, my weekends. So what advice do you have for those weekend warriors that still want to put in a DIY hunt for them to still kind of scratch that itch? Well, you could stay pretty close to home. It would be one thing that you could do. Um, you know, if you're in the East, Ohio and Kentucky are good states to go to. Um, you know, there's so many different ways to do it. You can, my, I cover a lot of information in my book on how to cut costs, how, you know, how to stay cheap, how to, you know, you don't want to eat a week of eating in restaurants will just eat you alive, not just with money, but you're just sick of restaurant food, you oh, know? Yeah. And I do some pretty creative things like uh, take a crock pot and the, um, have several frozen meals and then uh, just drop one in the crock pot, the slow cooker in the morning, put it on low. And when I come in from the stand in the evening, I got a, I got a roast or a stew or something like that hot. And, and that really helps keep getting a hot meal in. you really helps keep you going. If you just live on granola bars for a week, you really want run down, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, so there, there's, there's the cost aspect of it. Um, you can do this really cheap. It's, it's surprising how uh minimal output of cash you got to have to do this um so you know just i i just say just do it just make a sacrifice and do it because you'll you're not getting any younger and uh um you might get addicted to this like i kind of did but um you might do it for a week and you know i i got a friend that thought this was going to be the big thing for him and he did one trip and it's like eh I think I'd rather just sleep in my own bed, you know? Right. So, uh, it just wasn't for him. Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, you don't know until you try. That's right. And I'm in the same camp as you where it was last year, just kind of went for it. And you're right. It's if you, I went with two buddies, we, we pulled my one friend's camper out and we just, you know, bought a campground site. I think it was 10 or $15 a day or something like that. Um, and then we packed up some food and we had, you know, warm meals in the evening. So we didn't really have to hit restaurants and stuff like that while, while we were there and excluding the cost of my tag, this is Ohio. So excluding the cost of my tag with gas and everything. I mean, I want to say without the tag, I probably spent less than $500 on the, on the whole trip. And it was a 10 day trip. Right. You know, so that's, that's an advantage to having a partner too, because you're splitting a lot of those costs, you're splitting gas and so forth. And, uh, you know, having a partner is just, is not a decision to take lightly though. In fact, I spent a whole chapter on that in my book because, um, I got one buddy that I, I love hunting with and I don't have to motivate him, but, um, if you find yourself in a situation with a partner who you keep having to get out of bed in the morning and, uh, uh, you know, and you're, you're trying to motivate yourself and somebody else, then, uh, you know, that, that's a real drag on you. And, the other thing with a partner is uh, you're sharing everything that you find, of course. Mm-hmm. And if you find that one really good spot where you go, oh, man, we I know I'm going to kill a buck here if I put the time in, then you have to split that spot up, you know, mm-hmm. with a sw- uh, You know, how do you work that out with your buddy yeah. and, and be fair, you know? So there's pluses and minuses to having a partner. There's definitely pros and there's definitely cons, too. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, at 4 a.m. It's it's hard for me to muster enough motivation for myself, let alone someone, let alone someone else. And uh, I did have a pretty prime spot last year. And after I took my buck, um, I actually put my buddy in in my tree stand and he he took a nice deer the uh, the following day. So we, we shared well on that trip. But I do want to be sensitive to your time here. So I'll ask you for only one more uh, one more question or request, I guess, if you will. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I always like to have our guests share with us a hunting story. Um, it can either be of a successful harvest or just an interesting experience or the one that maybe got away. But if you wouldn't mind uh, indulging us with uh, one of your hunting stories and uh, give us every detail from who you're hunting with, what state you're hunting, and uh, all the way back to the tailgate of the truck. 
Um, I, if you don't mind, I'll tell you a story that kind of illustrates what DIY public planning hunting can be like without killing a deer. And this an unusual situation where I had, uh, um, I thought I was on the public land and, um, I had actually crossed over onto private land where I was hunting and, um, I, it was about an hour after daylight one morning and here comes a guy walking up to me with a bow and he stands at the bottom of my tree and I'm thinking, what the heck is this guy doing? And, uh, he says, you don't, you don't have permission to be here. And I'm like, well, I'm on public land. And, uh, so this was before smartphones. This is quite a few years ago, but, right. um, so I climbed down. I'm like, okay, I better talk to this guy. Cause I got a trail camera right over here. I'm sitting in a tree stand and, and he actually showed me a, map of the property lines and i was off the i was off the public land and he could have been a real jerk you know right but he was like um you know he said why don't you send you know you got to stand here why don't you go ahead and hunt it and uh um you know so after i i talked to him a couple more times during the week i told him what i was seeing and and i i texted him a couple of trail camera pictures and stuff like that and um it's like this guy's one of my best friends and, um, I've, I've, I've hunted with him several times now. And so, you know, public land hunting can be really adversarial because I've run into some people that are really hard to get along with. And, but if, if you see everybody as a potential friend, you already have something in common, right? You know, you're a hunter. So you already have one thing in common and you cut, you have, you probably have a pretty common goal and that's to try to find a mature buck and shoot it. So if you can just build off of that, um, you know, that, that's a story I'd like to leave you with because I've, I've killed quite a few deer and, um, I've, I've done okay. But, uh, the, the stories that I really remember are the experiences I had and the really cool places I've been and, uh, you know, seeing a huge mule deer walk right by my huge four by four mule deer walk right by my stand when I only had a white tail tag. And the first, uh, that was in Northwest Kansas. And then the first time I went to Montana, with a ladder stand and had to go to town and buy all new ratchet straps because all the cottonwood trees are 200 years old, and about 12 feet around. <laughs> and, you know, there, there's just so many things you learn and the, 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 they make great campfire stories. Right. That's for sure. And I, I appreciate that story that you share because I think you made a good point there where it's like, you know, there's enough folks, you know, or detractors, if you will, um, for us hunters, you know, that it doesn't do us any good to, to argue and infight with one another. We already, to your point, we already have common ground to build a, re- a relationship and a mutual respect from. So why wouldn't we take advantage of that and make sure that we're all aligned and kind of working toward the same goal, which is, you know, making sure that this, you know, thing that we love and have a passion for that we're able to continue to do it and that we continue to have public lands to hunt and, um, you know, and all kind of rally around the same cause. So I appreciate that story. But before we let you go, I want to make sure that we give uh, you an opportunity to let the folks out there listening know where they can learn more about you or pick up the uh, the books that you've written. Two things I'd like to um, to uh, tell you about. Number one, of course, is my book called The Freelance Bowhunter. And my website's burningoutdoors.com. It's really easy to remember, just burningoutdoors.com. You can buy The Freelance Bowhunter book on there. Um, it it's called uh, do it yourself strategies for the traveling hunter and tom miranda did a really nice uh forward for me i've known tom for many many years way before he was famous even <laughs> and uh it's got a lot of a lot of really good reviews from some really well-known people this is not a book it's not another book on how to hunt scrapes and rubs this is how to have a successful deer hunt away from home and then also that section in the back that covers these 16 destination states has a lot of value it tells you which counties in each state produce the most Pope and Young bucks and everything like that. And then also I have a uh, weekly email blast that goes out. I have 34,000 subscribers now to this week's email blast. And uh, it's, it's called Bucks, Bulls, and Bears. And you can go to BucksBullsAndBears.com, BucksBullsAndBears.com, and uh, sign up for that weekly email blast. It's just a lot of interesting stuff, um, kind of geared towards a DIY hunter. And, uh, it's, it's just a free email blast. If you don't like it, you can unsubscribe, but I'd love to see people sign up for that also. 
Awesome. Yeah, I think uh, just everyone go out and make sure to check out those uh, spots Bernie mentioned. Also, I would give a a mention to be sure to follow him on Facebook as well. That way you're uh, always kind of looped in and privy to the newest things that Bernie's up to. But Bernie, I do appreciate you coming on and making time. It was great getting to uh, connect with you, enjoyed the stories, and uh, of course, your, your wealth of knowledge that you were able to share. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. I want to thank Bernie for joining, and be sure to check out Bernie's site, BucksBullsBears.com. You can find, of course, all the books that he's written there on a wide variety of topics. And uh, be sure to head over and follow him on Facebook and on his YouTube channel as well. He shares some great video tips uh, on his YouTube channel that are definitely worth checking out. Uh, I'll, of course, put all these related links in the uh, blog post show notes for you to easily find. Also, I want to make sure to thank all of you for tuning in and giving me an hour plus of your day again. And uh, be sure to hit that iTunes subscribe button so you don't miss a single upcoming episode. Also, please head over to iTunes and uh, leave us a five-star iTunes rating if you would. We'd be very much appreciative of your review. And uh, be sure to follow The uh, Truth From The Stand on Instagram and Facebook. If you'd like to get involved in the show uh, in some way, shape, or form uh, and, and have us or a guest answer your questions, or if you'd just like to recommend a topic for discussion, email me your suggestions at truthfromthestand at gmail.com or click the email button on our Instagram account and leave us a message. And finally, I need to give a big shout out to our partners that continue to help us make this podcast possible. Whitetail Institute of North America, Exodus Outdoor Gear, and Lone Wolf Portable Tree Stands. So until next time, we'll see y'all. Nationalize yourself in numbers, but I gotta get